Thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we're both delighted. Okay, well, I hope I can, I can be of some use. Many of us following the Fukushima disaster have grown to understand the enormous implications for mankind from the threat of nuclear power, but we've only just begun to grasp these implications. You, however, have been researching and teaching about this for a long time. What was your initiation into this field originally? Well, I was living up a mountain uh, with my family uh, at the time of the Chernobyl accident um, in Wales. And a lot of the radioactivity rained down um, in May of that year, uh, and uh, everyone was saying how safe it was. I mean, the first thing the government said was how safe it was. I, I did have a bit of an idea about, about the effects of radi radiation, because um, one of the reasons we moved to Wales was, was uh, in order to avoid being bombed by the Russians. At that time, everybody thought there was going to be a massive nuclear war. So, so we decided to go somewhere where we might be a bit safer. So I had a bit of an idea of what was going on, and of course it was quite clear that, that this was all um, all a pack of lies. So I got it, I got I got involved then in the uh, in the idea of looking uh, at how radioactivity could affect people because I had worked in the pharmaceutical industry and I'd done physiology and pharmacology and I worked at the molecular level on 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 the biology of the cell, you know. So. I had a kind of physical chemistry approach to, to it, which, which, is in, which was at that time entirely missing, and, and, and actually to a large extent is still missing. Uh, and this is essentially the difference between the current risk model that there is and the one that my colleagues and I have developed over the last 20 years, uh, is, is, is looking at radioactivity um, from the point of view of biological systems and chemistry rather than looking at it from the point of view of physics. So you basically began your research studying something that had never been studied before. Well, not in the way I was studying it. Uh, I mean, it's certainly been studied before. I mean, the, the health effects of, radi of radiation had been studied uh, in, for the whole of the last century, certainly from about 1925. And, and after 1952, it began to be studied a lot uh, because there, were all, there, were, there, there was a lot of nuclear weapons testing and people were concerned, you know, quite rightly, actually, uh, that the fallout, the strontium-90 and uh, plutonium and cesium-137 and all that stuff, that was raining down on them around in the 19, period about 1959 to 63, when, when the Russians and the United States were doing these big megaton tests. People were concerned that that might be uh, harming them, and they were quite right, it was harming them. But of course, the authorities, the military and so on, they wanted to continue to do the testing, you see. So, so they took control of the uh, research into the health effects of, of radiation. And they kind of had control of it ever since, up until the mid-90s when we started to make an impact. Um, that, that's how it all happened. So, so they, they, had already, they had already uh, got a model which they used and still use, which is a physics-based model, but, but where we came in was to look at it from the point of view of chemistry and biology, and that was new then, but it's not new now. Do any of your children or family work in this field as well? Well, my, one of my, uh, my, my eldest daughter helped me a lot. Well, she is actually a social anthropologist, but she studied natural sciences at Cambridge. Um, and when I was first looking into this, in the, after Chernobyl, around about 1987, she was, she was just up there. She did two years of natural sciences. And then she got, and they all did, they all did sciences for their, at school, so they concentrated on science. Because I kind of think science is important, you know. I, I think a mathematical analysis of the world is very valuable. Because too many people can just wave their arms and say, oh, yes, this is good, or this is bad, or this is very big, or this is very small. You have to have some kind of ability to deal with numbers in, in order to investigate and find the truth. Of course, you can take it too far. Anyway, so yeah, so this, that, that daughter that helped me a fair bit. And the second, my second daughter, she became an epidemiologist. In fact, she studied, studied the health effects of radiation for her MSc at, at Imperial College. Uh, and now she's quite, she's quite a well-known epidemiologist, quite a famous one. You can find her on the internet. Um, so yeah, so two of them, two of them uh, did, did 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 help with this. Yeah. There's a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions that I ask everyone that I interview. One is, what were your thoughts when you first heard about Fukushima? And there's a couple of questions that I ask everyone that I interview. One is, what were your thoughts when you first heard about Fukushima? And when did you realize we were in big trouble? 
Well, more or less from the beginning. I mean, I first heard about it because the, the woman who lives in the, in the house that I've got here um, sent me a text message to say there's something that happened there and there'd been some explosion. I was in France at the time. <clears throat> and I, as luck, I mean, I've always been luckily, or, or maybe unluckily, but certainly uh, fortuitously in the right place at the right time. So I was just coming back from France to London when uh, I heard about this. And I was in London on the first day after the explosion, and, and then the BBC phoned me up and said, you know, we, we need somebody to talk about this, and so I, I, I was right there at the beginning. And of course, from the beginning, it was quite clear to me that this was a similar sort of incident to Chernobyl. I mean, you don't, you don't have an explosion at a nuclear power station which is safe. It doesn't, it just doesn't, it's not possible. Um, and then when I learned more about the kind of explosion, of course, they were saying it was a hydrogen explosion, but then they said that, that Chernobyl was a hydrogen explosion. And all of the pro-nuclear scientists, of course, came out of their boxes to say how safe it was. Endless string of these people coming out on the television and, and, and radio saying there was no problem. It was quite clear to me that there was a big problem. I didn't know how big, but I mean, I quickly figured out that it was very big. And, and then I just started to say how big it was. You know, I, I thought it was probably comparable at Chernobyl from the beginning. And it turns out that it was. So in fact, it's worse in a way because there are far more people living close by. I, I mean, Chernobyl was in an area where there was not a huge population density, but it, but in that part of Japan, there's a very big population density. So a lot more people got exposed. Dr. Busby, where do you think the corium is, and what is it doing? Yokaku had stated two months ago that at reactor two. The corium is now liquefied, something that had never happened before in the history of nuclear power, but this means it would have to be 5,000 degrees or hotter. Arnie Gunderson yeah, sure. Well, I, think, I think about 3,800, 4,000, something like that. It certainly got to that temperature, in my opinion, uh, and probably it's melted through the reactor pressure vessel, in my opinion. It's probably somewhere down in the ground. I mean, Russia today told me that they had evidence at some time people were saying that there were big cracks appearing in the ground and steam was coming out and the radioactivity was very high but when they got close to measure it, measure it around about that time. So I, I would, I mean, I'm, you know, we don't know, but my guess is that it's through the reactor pressure vessel and into the ground. And then what it'll do is it'll spread out until it gets to a sort of self-limiting point. Um, so, so there'll be a lot, of, a, a lot of heat being generated, but it will generally cool itself as it spreads out and then it'll be contaminating the groundwater. I think that's probably where we are at the moment. It'll be still fissioning, of course, so there'll be loads of stuff still coming out. Uh, you know, uh, I, and in fact, I think we know that, because uh, there, were, there were some measurements made of xenon isotopes that, that had very short half-lives. I mean, when was that? That was about Christmas time, last Christmas time. To be honest, I haven't really followed it very closely. I, I've got a lot of other things to do on dealing with up in Europe at the moment, and uranium, and this and that, you know, so I, I, I more or less said what I had to say about Fukushima, and it seemed to me that an awful lot of people were looking at it now, <clears throat> and, I, and I, could, um, I could relax slightly and get on with other stuff. You know, I get, I get hundreds of emails all the time telling me about, you know, sort of blow-by-blow blow accounts about what's happening out there. Um, and I just can't deal with all of them, you know, so I, I just scan them through very quickly, and uh, and pick out the odd one that seems interesting. And I assume if anything serious happens, somebody will get in touch with me, and usually that is the case. I've read that the corium underground would gradually pick up dirt and cool and shut itself down, but is the fact that we're pouring salt water on these reactor cores perpetuating a continuous reaction, kind of like a, a sodium reactor? Well, um, one thing that if you pour the, the salt water on them continuously is you create a much more um, volatile form of uranium because the, 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 the halides of uranium, so you could get reactions in principle chemically, you could get reactions taking place there which would cause the uranium to become more volatile. And there's an awful lot of uranium there. Um, and, and I agree with you, whoever said that, that, that it would slowly, you know, d distribute itself till it cools slightly. And then, but it will only cool slightly. It's not going to go to the point where it will cool down like you could put your hand on it or anything. You're still talking about a horribly high temperature. And there's a lot, there are lots of quite volatile radionuclides in, in all of that, which, which will evaporate. I mean, one serious one that nobody has, has looked at or measured, except me, is lead 210. 
Now, lead-210 is, is a natural radionuclide decay product of radium-226, which is also which is a decay product of uranium. Um, and lead-210 has a daughter, polonium-210, which is an alpha emitter, which is the one that they killed that spy Litvinenko with. Now, now, lead is very, very volatile. So at the sort of temperature that the corium, as you call it, is, it's quite likely that it will have volatilized all the lead, and, and this will have distributed itself all over all over the area. I mean, I certainly measured it in Tokyo. So we had a, I, I think I put out um, recently, um, well, in fact, you, you, I think Miss Milky the Clown put out, put, copied it quickly, but uh, we found lead 210 in this air conditioning filter in in Tokyo, quite a lot of it. So that's quite a serious new client, that one. This question came from Daniel Albodi. Is there a possibility of the corium causing an interaction of epic magnitude, such as a hydrovolcanic explosion? Yeah, will it go bang? Um, I, I, I think, well, well I, don't, I mean, I don't know. You know, we're, we're, this is, we, are, we are totally in new territory here. And I wouldn't like to say what would happen. I, I mean, all I can give you is a sort of basic physical chemist's approach to what I think is likely. And I, I think I don't think it's likely that there will be any serious explosion. I, I think that what what's most likely is that it will continually contaminate the environment more or less forever, unless unless somehow you can isolate it by getting underneath it or around it at a low enough level so that the, whatever goes on there to cool it can't wash the radionuclides out into the sea. Otherwise, uh, all of that stuff is going to slowly corrode and get washed out into the sea, and then it will contaminate the whole coast. It seems to me that that's the most likely scenario. The idea that it's suddenly going to go bang, I think, is increasingly remote, because I think if it was going to do that, it would have probably done it by now. You, you, you see, the, the only way it will go bang is if there's some kind of critical fission. And, uh, and that would depend upon uh, increasing what they call the F number, above one point naught. Uh, and I can't see really how that could happen, given that it's distributed itself down into the ground and spread out. It doesn't seem likely that that can happen. I, I think what happened originally was it got hot enough to volatilize the plutonium. See, in these reactors, there's always plutonium. And in reactor three, there was plutonium they put in there in the first place. And plutonium has a lower boiling point uh, to uranium. So, uh, in principle, if you heat the thing up high enough, what will happen is the plutonium comes off first, a bit like fractional distillation of oil. So, as the plutonium comes off, it will then condense in a cooler part of the or whatever it is it's coming off into, the pressure vessel, I guess, or whatever it is. And, and you only need about 9 kilograms of plutonium to, to have a critical mass. So, that could then explode, and then it will blow everything up in the air. I think that's probably what happened with reactor 3. But it's hard to see how that could happen naturally with, 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 with it having melted out and dispersed into the soil. It's hard to see, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. I mean, I don't know enough about it. I, I have no idea what's really going on there, and I don't think anybody could ever sort of really do this kind of experiment. If so it's, you, it's, it's new stuff. If you had complete control over the site and money was no object, how would you contain Fukushima? Yeah, yeah, okay, good question. i tell you what I would do is I would, um, well, there were two ideas I had. One was to blow it into the sea with straight charges, uh, was to see it's a seal off the harbor, uh, but I think it's... If you had complete control over the site and money was no object, how would you contain Fukushima? Yeah, yeah, okay, good question. i tell you what I would do is I would, um, well, there were two ideas I had. One was to blow it into the sea with straight charges, uh, was to see it's a seal off the harbor, uh, but I think it's probably too late for that now. Um, and once, if you, if you, if the, the problem is it's, it's extraordinarily radioactive, so you can't get close to it. Robots won't work, and you can't put men in there. And anyway, even if you could, you don't have the men who would go in there. I mean, the Russians put men in there, and they went in there, and, and they did what they had to do. But I don't think the Japanese would put that. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of liquidators went in and sorted out the Russian one. So I think what you have to do is kind of leave it where it is, but isolate it from the environment. And the only way to do that is to dig a, a, number, a, a number of concentric trenches around the site. So you'd have to dig around the site deep enough to go below anywhere where the water is likely to seep underneath your trench, and then fill those trenches up with, with non-permeable 
concrete or something or line them so that any water then that's washed into the reactor that you're using to cool it will then wash into these trenches and then you then take this water and pump it back in and just recirculate it.